Hi, if you're joining us for the first time, you might find it helpful to begin with video one, in which my partner and I present the need for building evidence in child welfare, discuss some of the challenges, and then introduce the framework to design, test, spread, and sustain effective child welfare practice. Each phase of this framework consists of distinct steps, and together, its five phases form a complete process for building and spreading effective practice. The framework begins with an expectation to identify and explore before moving on to one or more of the other phases. Develop and test, compare and learn, replicate and adapt, and apply and improve are sequential and cyclical phases that follow identify and explore and build on one another to support the implementation of evidence-based practice. Identify and explore will be our focus in this video. To discuss this initial phase in the framework, my colleague Shar will join us. Shar is a child welfare director who recently contacted me because a large number of families in her state are entering the system due to repeat referrals for neglect, and she wanted to discuss ways to address this problem. Great. Welcome, Shar. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be here. The purpose of Identify and Explore is to either select an intervention with an existing evidence base or to decide to develop an intervention based on theory and practice knowledge that addresses an identified problem. Yes, this is tricky. I have a tendency to rush through this process. Lots of people do, especially in their eagerness to fix problems. The framework requires that we slow down and follow some deliberate steps. The key steps for this phase are identify the problem, understand the problem, develop a theory of change, research solutions, and choose a solution. The first step in identify and explore is problem identification. Problems or areas of practice or system performance that need to be improved are identified in a variety of ways. Sometimes areas needing improvement are identified through external processes, like federal monitoring reviews. I often identify problems when I'm reviewing reports produced by our data shop but sometimes problem identification is out of my hands. For example, we had a child fatality a few years ago. The governor's office conducted an independent investigation and ordered an overhaul of the intake and investigation system as a result. How a problem is identified can arise for many reasons, and it's important to involve multiple stakeholders in defining the problem. Once the problem has been identified, it's important that we understand it first before attempting to find an appropriate solution. This includes understanding the prevalence of the problem, the nature of the problem, the population most at risk of experiencing the problem, and whether cultural or contextual factors need to be taken into consideration. Last year, our administrative reports showed that a large number of those families with a history of recurring allegations of maltreatment had been referred for neglect. This resulted in multiple agency investigations with the same families. Good example. To understand the prevalence and nature of the problem, a team might be assigned to review all of the applicable referrals, investigations, and case data. The team might look for similarities in child and family characteristics, behavior, and circumstances, trying to identify possible predictors of referral, like risk and protective factors. It might also examine the agency's investigation processes and quality of service delivery to the families. The team might even discuss findings with other jurisdictions to compare repeat referral rates and consider the potential influence of larger social and economic conditions. It could also review the cases of children and families that didn't have repeat referrals to try to understand what factors may have supported families and reduced the likelihood of repeat maltreatment. I agree that this approach could help us better understand neglect allegations, the families being referred, and our service decisions. Sometimes in child welfare, we actually choose an intervention before we fully understand the problem. For this repeat recurrence problem, I'm getting a lot of pressure from the Commissioner of the Agency for Human Services in my state to implement an intervention that a faraway state has had some success with. I've read a little bit about it, it sounds great, and it has an evidence base. But we haven't done the research you're talking about, and I don't even know much about which families are being referred for neglect again and again. Right. That state's intervention might be great for your agency to implement, but it also might not. There's more work to do before you choose any particular solution. Well, let's imagine that we learn from our team's assessment of the problem 
that most repeat referrals for neglect were for single parent, immigrant families, and neighborhoods that are experiencing high rates of poverty and homelessness. This would be our target population. Okay. Now that we have a better understanding of the problem and who we intend to target for the intervention, the next step is to develop a theory of change. Now we are in my wheelhouse. I can explain a theory of change. Once we understand the problem, the target population, and the needs of the target population, it's important to articulate our assumptions. By assumptions, I mean the series of actions that we believe will result in our desired short- and long-term outcomes. What outcomes do you want to result from your intervention? The outcome we want is improved safety for kids who are experiencing chronic neglect. If we are able to keep these children safe after coming into contact with our agency the first time, then my agency might have a lower rate of repeat referrals and fewer investigations. Great. And what type of services would be needed in order to achieve those outcomes? These parents are dealing with so many issues, but if we found that poverty and homelessness seem to be the greatest threat to these families, we'd probably need to work with other agencies to make concrete services and resources more accessible, like income support and stable housing, employment, and child care. Okay, a theory of change articulates our ideas about how the intervention will change the outcomes for our target population. So in your example, you might say, that if case management and concrete services are more accessible to help immigrant parents identify and navigate available resources, find stable housing, and pay for child care, then children's basic needs for things like good nutrition and preventive medical care are more likely to be met. More children will have a safe and secure place to live, and more young children will receive necessary care and supervision while their parents are at work or out seeking employment. While many families certainly face additional challenges like substance abuse, mental health problems, or poor parenting skills, meeting these chronic needs might substantially reduce the most frequent and pervasive reasons identified by your agency's review of investigations and referrals for neglect. By addressing these fundamental issues, you would expect the safety outcomes for this target population to improve. Right. And once you have a strong theory of change, it will help to narrow your search for possible interventions. The intervention must address the problem and also be appropriate for the characteristics and needs of the target population. It's important that you also choose an intervention that fits your agency's capacity, budget, and political context. Yes, this part really worries me. If after this research, I find that the commissioner's intervention isn't the best fit, I think it's going to be very difficult to convince her otherwise. That's one reason why identify and explore is so helpful. If we take the time to identify the problem, understand it, research possible solutions, and then choose a good solution that fits, we'll have a strong rationale for our decision to share with our stakeholders. We'll be able to clearly explain why a particular intervention may or may not be the best choice to address our problem. We'll have more than that. We'll have made choices that increase the chances that our intervention will successfully address the problem. We'll also have an important basis for designing our evaluation. We'll be able to ask evaluation questions that gauge whether our intervention is working as expected and whether the assumptions in our theory of change are true. We'll be in a better position to learn. Do you mean that if we provide comprehensive assessment and case management, secure resources, and provide concrete services, but our rates of referral and investigations of neglect still increase, then we'll know that other factors that we haven't considered could be contributing to the problem? That's certainly one possibility. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. I get it. Next video, right? Exactly. In the next video, we will take a step further into the framework and discuss, develop, and test, and compare and learn.